Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I think we should begin here. We did have some people just log on in the last minute or two. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Judd Halenza. Uh, today's webinar is AI Machine Learning for Sales Forecasting. Uh, we're excited to offer this webinar. This is the first in a series of webinars that we will be doing on AI learning. Uh, that is, excuse me, AI machine learning. Uh, Sam, next slide. Uh, today's speakers, today's presenters are Sam Khan. He's been a practice lead here at AlphaBold for uh, last year. He is a practice lead for uh, AI machine learning and Internet of Things. Uh, he has 15 years worth of experience in cloud and artificial intelligence. He's very, very knowledgeable, uh, our obviously resident expert here at AlphaBold. Um, so this should be a really interesting webinar with him presenting because he pretty much knows everything about it. Uh, my name is Judd Halenza. I am a client engagement manager here at AlphaBold. I have over 10 years of software sales experience. And in addition, we have Tayab Ali. Unfortunately, no picture of Tayab uh, because he just kind of hopped on here at the last moment. Uh, he is the VP of consulting here at AlphaBold, and he will give a brief overview of uh, sales forecasting so uh, everybody has kind of a better understanding as to what sales for forecasting consists of. Uh, next slide, Sam. Today's agenda, uh, we will be covering uh, the AI journey, uh, what that looks like, obviously sales forecasting, some of the challenges and insights of sales forecasting. Uh, we will dive into uh, time series forecasting and go over some of the popular techniques that people, in, or excuse me, businesses use uh, when it comes to time series forecasting. And then we will move into machine learning and kind of review some experiences, or excuse me, ex uh, experiments. Uh, and then finally talk about Microsoft's Azure Auto Machine Learning and give an example of that. And then finally we'll move into a question and answer session. Uh, at this point I'd like to introduce Taya Bali who is going to review uh, sales forecasting with us. Taya? Hi everyone, this is Tayab. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. So just off the bat wanted to, um, I'm pretty sure all of you know what I'm going to say, but it's more about introducing sales forecasting from the uh, perspective of the flow of this webinar. So very simply put, it is just a way to predict future sales. And there are multiple ways to go about that. And we'll talk about that in a lot of detail throughout the course of this webinar. Uh, but for this slide, uh, most important two types of sales forecasting is going to be short term and long term. So short term is mostly used by organizations to handle their productions uh, as it is in place. And long term is primarily used for uh, strategy planning and being able to see how they want to plan on organization's growth. So as you can imagine, because sales forecasting is going is playing a role with uh, future uh, forecasting and setting organization goals, it is a very important aspect of overall strategy for an organization. And hence, it's very important to have some sort of accuracy tied to your future sales predictions. Uh, it's important because Mostly your revenue targets are defined by your sales forecasting and then it is the driver for your costs on your workforce, your cash flow management, all of your resource management. So it's important to have um, some accuracy tied to it and have some sort of faith or trust in the forecast that you have for your organization. So with that, uh, I'm going to go on to the next slide and talk about the fact that Traditionally speaking, the way sales forecasting is done is that you look at the historical and you try to predict the future. And that poses some challenges which obviously have to be mitigated if sales forecasting is going to play a pivotal role in your strategy or your organization. So the challenges that uh, it poses is, for example, uh, let's say if we look at the historical and we look at the sales of a product in 
Christmas time frame or Thanksgiving time frame, then there would be a spike there. So as you would imagine, we cannot use that November and December sales to be able to predict January, February, and March. So traditional, just looking at historical sale forecasting would fail in those instances. Similarly, let's say if we launch a product and there's a huge discount being given because we are still launching it in the month of June and it's the end of the fiscal year and our sales team has to meet their sales quotas, then this cannot be used to predict sales for the next year as well as well as the rest of the months because if I use June's numbers to predict July, August, and September, it won't be realistic and accurate extrapolation of that data. Some more examples, so if you have two similar products that are launched in two different months, one is launched say in June, the other is launched in December, and uh, the, uh, the seasonality has an impact uh, on the sales, then again we have to take those things into consideration as we try to do the forecast or the sales forecast for that product. So these are mostly internal factors, but there are also some external factors that are equally important to consider for your accurate sales forecasting. And from that front, uh, for example, if there's a competitor product and that is selling in the same time span, this can be one of the reasons for your product to have lower sales during that same time. So you have to consider that as you evaluate the future sales of your product. And then obviously more holistic events such as recession, disasters, medical emergencies, like the one we are going through, have an impact as well. So how we go about mitigating these risks is where AI helps us. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Sam to talk and walk us through some of those examples and show us some demonstrations. All right, thank you so much, Tayab, uh, for setting the stage here. Uh, so before uh, we get into some of the details regarding AI, um, it's important that I take a moment here and talk a little bit about what AI can or cannot do. Uh, first off, um, AI is not a silver bullet or, or a magic cure. And by that, what I mean is that it's not a solution in and of itself. It's actually a piece in the puzzle. And in most cases, it's a strategic puzzle uh, that can actually give a competitive advantage to the implementing organization. So since it can provide a strategic edge, therefore it's imperative for uh, your organization or company to set clear goals on what it wants AI to do uh, to begin with. So that actually happens when the due diligence is, is performed internally, some of those things that Taya was mentioning earlier, as to, and, and also revisiting how the business is currently being conducted and you know what should be the end state and where we wanna we where we wanna go to essentially. So setting the goals is, is super important right from the get-go. So once the goals are identified, then it's a turn of investing into gathering the representative data. Uh, so long established companies have data available uh, but you know they have that advantage. But that data is not unified. I mean scattered across in different islands, if you will. I mean, for example, some of the, the data is going to be available in the finance applications, some in sales uh, applications and operations and stuff like that. But it has to be unified and the gaps in the data um, have to be filled so that, you know, you can come up with a representative data set that can be fed as input to the uh, AI modeling process. So, um, so, for a, so the lifeblood of a successful AI model uh, is the quality of the data on which it's trained, and it, it and it keeps learning, by the way, over a period of time, and 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 you know it starts pro providing reliable results and predictions only if the data that is being fed to it is a representative to start with. All right. So moving on, um, it's the turn of identifying the technology stack uh, and the solution uh, for the solution implementation. You can bring in the experts who could help you uh, and guide you through that process. And uh, lastly. This is the most important point. Um, you know, you have the goal set, the data is gathered, the tools and technologies have been finalized. So rather than going all in uh, for experimentation, it's almost always advisable to break those goals down into smaller goals and objectives. So you can pick one of those and start experimentation over that. So once that smaller objective is, is achieved and it starts uh, providing reliable results, then, you know, it, then we have to progressively build the solution around and on top of it. Uh, so please keep in mind that AI models take time to mature. 
And that is the reason why we say that AI is a journey uh, from uh, inception to production. It's not something that can be achieved in a day or for that matter in a fortnight even. So it has to be something that has to be invested over a period of time. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, let's get back to the uh, sales forecasting topic. Now in this particular slide, I'm gonna be talking about sales forecasting insights. Uh, primarily, there are two types. So qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative, simply put, is the gut feel or the foresight of the executive leadership that is developed over the years of working in the industry, um, basically their experience. So for example, uh, if you're in a dairy business and want to launch a new ice cream flavor in summer, in the upcoming summer, then in such situations, um, you're mostly relying on the direction given by the uh, executive leadership regarding the uh, product's launch, its target market demographic, the time on which it's it's launched, and its sales targets. Uh, the other type is quantitative. As the name suggests, it relates to numbers, more specifically historical sales numbers. So since we are talking about sales forecasting, it's from a quantitative standpoint, it's carried out by using a methodology, which is known as time series forecasting. All right, so let's talk a little bit about time series forecasting in this slide. So time series forecasting um, is used to predict the future events by analyzing the trends of the past. That is where it comes in line with AI. So more specifically, the data analysts or the data scientists examine the historical data to check the patterns or to identify the patterns such as trends, seasonality, cycles, and regularity. And uh, besides sales, I mean, sales is not the only department that can utilize this methodology. Other departments in the company like finance, operations, and marketing, for example, can also use the methodology for inventory and consumer demand purposes. All right, so uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the popular forecasting techniques. Uh, so on a broader level, uh, we have uh, two types or two types of uh, two approaches in a way. So the first one is like taking the statistical, traditional statistical approach. Well, uh, these, I mean, uh, if you were to go with statistical modeling, there are a number of algorithms and models available and they have been uh, in use for decades now, they're still heavily in use. Um, and I've just mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, a few of the more popular ones out there, but as I mentioned before, there are quite a number of them that can actually be used during the exploratory phase by the data analysts uh, in order to identify the best or the most suitable algorithm that fits the given requirement. So some of the more popular ones are uh, autoregressive integrated moving average uh, uh, algorithm, which is a mouthful, but it's you know generally known as ARIMA. And the other one is simple, exp and by the way, I'm just going to be showing um, a demo of a, an experiment of ARIMA also in a bit. And then we're talking about simple exponential smoothing. This is another one, and the last one is whole pointers exponential smoothing. Okay, aside to the traditional statistical approaches, you know, in recent times, another approach has also, uh, you know, uh, come to the fore, which is machine learning. This, by the way, is, is disrupting the way uh, things have traditionally been done, and is also seen as an opportunity to unlock some of the others, other challenges also that were like seen as, as very difficult to find solutions for. So as far as this webinar, I'll show you uh, an example of a neural network. And I'll, I will also show, uh, give you an overview of the uh, most powerful, one of the most powerful AI services that is available in the Azure Cloud platform. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. All right, so since we talked about uh, Machine learning, I think in this slide, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, machine learning in a little more detail. So machine learning pri primarily is a data science methodology that allows computers to, um, to learn from uh, the historical data to forecast or predict the future behaviors, outcomes, and trends. So machine learning uh, 
enables uh, systems to learn without being explicitly programmed. So, I mean, this is the biggest takeaway here when machine learning is compared with the traditional software development. Because traditional software development is more logic driven, whereas machine learning is more data insight driven. So some of the examples, uh, some of the more popular examples that I'm just going to be talking a little bit about, by the way, there are a handful, uh, there are quite a number of them, but uh, we'll talk uh, uh, a little bit about the ones that I mentioned on the slide here. Time series forecasting, which is, by the way, the topic of uh, today's webinar. Uh, that's one of the applications of AI. The other one is IoT predictive analytics. And an example of that could actually be an AI model predicting the remaining useful life of the industrial equipment and knowing ahead of time when a repair is due or a replacement. Product recommendations. Um, example is like buying from Amazon and I'm assuming that pretty much all of us have experience of doing that. So based on your buying history, the AI or the uh, machine learning algorithm makes recommendations for further impulsive purchases or, or buying or purchasing. This has created a lot of value for the company, by the way. So it's like a strategic initiative uh, for Amazon. Uh, another example is like fraud detection. So banks have started using machine learning to flag transactions that do not seem, look right or more specifically are fraudulent. So rather than having trained human analysts uh, flag such transactions, which as you can imagine, is quite challenging considering the sheer number of transactions committed in a day. So machine learning is, is really good at picking up nuances and subtleties, by the way, and is ideally suited to augment the human workforce, which is already being done. Okay, now uh, moving on to another example is cancer detection. So last and certainly not the least is the massive improvement AI is bringing to healthcare. So one such example is the detection of, I mean, is of lung cancer and machine learning success rate at accurately uh, detecting the disease was 97% uh, as per the study that was conducted by NVIDIA a couple of years back. Right, so moving on, I'm just going to be showing you uh, a couple of experiments here. But uh, before I do that, uh, Judd, if you have any questions uh, being submitted so far, then maybe we can field them right now. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I do not have any questions right now from our uh, audience, but uh, as soon as we do get a couple more, I will let you know. Okay, sounds good. All right, so, right, so let's talk about our uh, theorema model here. Okay, so this is, this is an experiment, which is a statistical experiment. Uh, and uh, if I were to show you the, uh, the data set here, so it's a very simple use case. And in the data set, we have two columns only. One is like the time dimension, which has a frequency, which, which has a monthly frequency. And the other one is basically the energy drink consumed. This is a consumption column, basically the number of items sold in a way. So it's essentially telling us the number of items of a given product type being consumed in a month. And the idea is to uh, predict the, the forecast over a period of time. So, in, so, I mean, this is like a univariate use case uh, where, you know, we are only using one feature for prediction, which is the time dimension. And the data set does not have other features such as like weather patterns or demography or age groups, etc. that may or may not have an implication on the outcome here. But as I said before, it's a, it's a simplified use case, so we'll probably start with that. And also give you um, a flavor of how it's it's is done using you know Python's uh, uh, you know Python's data science uh, uh, you know frameworks and stuff like that, and the and in and this whole uh, solution is actually uh, implemented in a Python IPython notebook or a Jupyter notebook as it's being uh, called these days. Okay, so here in this step we have imported the data set. I mean it's just going to show you the first five. Uh, um, you know, rows here, but you know, it actually has a lot many rows, uh, essentially. And the first thing that we do is we do a plotting of the input data, so on a time scale. So if you were to see it on x-axis, we have the uh, the time uh, 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 time series plotted, and on the y-axis we have the uh, we have the consumption, which is you know, which is basically what we want to predict going forward. So this is currently how the data looks like, and if you were to see from a visual standpoint which by the way is really important, this, these visualization techniques going forward, especially if you have 
huge data sets available which go in GB. So it's very difficult to eyeball these and everything and then you're relying on the visual tooling that are available out of the uh, box in the in the technology stacks that, that, that you have chosen. So another thing that I'm going to dovetail back to then an earlier point I made that you know the, the choosing of a specific technology stack is also very important. Anyway, so if you were to see that this actually shows a pretty much linear kind of like a projection here of, of the number of items sold over uh, over uh, a number of months. So it, it shows an increase in sales over time. Okay, so then comes the, the step of doing, you know, uh, uh, more pre-processing pre -processing here before we fit the ARIMA model on the data. And one of the things that is a requirement here is to ensure that the stationarity is there in the, in the data projection, which... Um, which is basic, which basically means that the statistical properties of a time series they do not change over time. And one way of, of knowing that is to see whether the mean is is constant as well as the standard deviation. Mean, by the way, as you can see, is also is, is not constant and is actually going up with the curve here. So the idea is to uh, pre-process this data, bring it to uh, to a representation where it's actually uh, more suitable to be to be provided as input to the RIMA model. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not like going through each and every step here in detail, but the idea is that we pre-process this data, we have to import ARIMA. ARIMA, by the way, is an amalgamation of uh, 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 different algorithms. One is the AR autoregressive model, the other one is the moving averages model. So the idea is that we import that uh, model and we provide the pre-process data set as input to that. And we try to fit that model on, on, on the, um, the pre-process data. And once that model is fit, the, the end objective of this experiment is to to see as to how we are pro, uh, projecting the uh, the forecast here. So if you were to see again, we are uh, doing some plots after we have uh, applied the model here and we are letting the model make predictions for us. So if you were to see this area, which is highlighted, right? So this is basically a projection uh, of, of, of the future sales forecast. And, and you can see that, I mean, we have, uh, stretch the time out in a way and over the period of time it's telling us that it's going to continue on the linear trend. I mean as I mentioned bef uh, before that you know it's a simplified use case it may not seem very practical at this point in time but the whole idea is to like you know take take a simple example because it's easier to explain as well but you know as for this experiment it, can, it is showing you with 95 percent confidence uh, of, of the outcome of this model that you know the forecast is actually going to continue on the same run Okay, so the, with, with ARIMA uh, being explained, we spice things up a little bit in the other experiment, which is the machine learning experiment. So we said, okay, it only had one dimension. It only had the time dimension. What if we had another column in there, right? What if we had a seasons column in there? Right? And we see whether that helps us in any way, shape or form, or that has an impact on the on the way this model is going to, or, or the model is going to behave, or the, the, the predictions are going to get affected by that. So we started doing some more experimentation. That was, in, and in this experiment, we were uh, thinking about using a neural network instead of using another statistical model. So we changed this data set a little bit. If you could see, I mean, this data column is the same as, as was being used in the, uh, in the experiment, in the earlier experiment. We have the same target column, which is the energy drink consume. And then we have introduced another column and we're calling it seasons. Just like in any other uh, experiment, it's time to start slicing and dicing the data, clean it out. For example, I'm just going to give you one example. And I mean, the seasons, I mean, you're looking at the seasons as winter, spring, these are springs. And mathematical models or AI models or even statistical models, they don't understand strings. So they have to be imported into numbers so that they can be fitted into the model. So here in this step, we have actually replaced the values with one hot encoding. So we encoded the, the string values uh, and then we started moving ahead. We, we started doing more and more, uh, you know, pre-processing here. And then this is again the charting that the, the plot that we charted again on the time axis, as well as on the, uh, on the Y axis, we have the consumption. So it also is showing us pretty much the exact same projection as, as it did in the previous example, because it's the same data set for at least those two, uh, uh, those two columns. Again, checking the stationarity here, um, uh, plotting uh, uh, the uh, the representation here. We have actually, you know, calculated time lags here as well uh, that we need to fit into into the model. Uh, 
you know, we have actually come up with like 12 lags here. Now that now this is this is basically an interesting step. That is where we are going to be pulling in the the machine, and this is where the machine learning uh, uh, you know processing starts. So everything else prior to that step was all pre-processing and preparing the data to bring it to to the stage. Okay, so so how machine learning actually works in a nutshell. So machine, in machine learning, uh, and if you're if you're using a supervised uh, learning uh, approach here. You know the data set, incoming data set is actually, or pre-processed data set is actually split into two. I'm not going to say halves, but in two portions. One portion, the bigger one. Then I, I mean, there is no hard and fast rule, but sometimes uh, you know it's it, it's advisable that you know you take one portion, which is like 70% of the pre-processed data set, the other one, the, the other uh, portion is 30%, and it could be like. 25, 75, anything that suits the experiment because this is a thing that is rigorous and it takes a, a few iterations before the models are reliably trained. But generally speaking, you have a bigger portion that you use for training the model. And think of training the model as if you're like making a child learn in a way. So you're letting the model know that, hey, this is the input and this is the expected output. And then you keep on doing that. This is the input, this is the expected output. And over a period of time, you let the model train and get better at understanding or identifying things or learning things right so so the learning set is actually sourced as input for training uh, and then the when when you when you, when your model is trained it's time to see the accuracy of of, uh, of the prediction that is going to come out with so how to, how to test that a simple approach is that you take that now this time around take the test data out that you stashed away somewhere else that was not sourced to the AI model because AI model is only trained on the training data, not on the testing data. That is your remaining portion that you did not use for training purposes. And you already know the outcome of that because it's like from the same data set. So this time around during testing, you only let the AI or you only provide AI model the inputs and you withhold the outputs because this time around you let the AI model make the prediction for you. All right. So when you only provide the input and the AI model only gives it and predicts the output for you, you take the output of the AI model and you compare that against the data that you already have available as part of your testing set. If the prediction is somewhat near to what you're expecting, then it's fine. If not, if, if, if there is, I mean, if the prediction is way off, then again, it's time to go back to the drawing board. And you have to keep on doing that uh, or maybe you know change things around during encoding or maybe you know tuning hyperparameters of the model or maybe you know uh, play around with the data a little bit more retrain that and maybe invest in data somewhat more because the data that you had was not enough in a way so eventually it's a rigorous process and you, when you get to a stage where your model starts giving you results that are more in line with what your expectation is and are more accurate then it's time to take this more or use this model in a given a setting where you can actually use that in an application or in a solution where it's like making predictions for you. So with that said, this is primarily what we're trying to do here in this step. We are actually, we, we have actually created training sites, testing sites. All right. So, and, and, and uh, we are actually now in this, uh, in this step uh, or in the following steps, we are pulling in a machine learning model, which is basically a neural network of the type LSTM, like this long short term memory. It only has one dense layer. And uh, here we are uh, fitting the model on the training data set. You can say this, this is the X axis, the import, Y is the, the outcome. And, and the epoch is 100. Epoch, is, by the way, is a fancy name of the number of iterations. So it's this, the idea is that this model is going to iterate on the given data set 100 times over. And after each iteration, the idea is that it's going to get better. So it's going to get better after each and every transaction, uh, each and every iteration or an epoch. So once, this is done, you know, it's time to take the predictions from the model. So you take predictions here in this step, and then you post-process, because we pre-processed a lot of information, it's time to post-process this information so that we can bring the predictions to the same unit so that we can we can do the plotting and uh, uh, against what the prediction was versus what the input data was. In so it goes through um, a, a, a number of steps for pre-processing purposes. And like, if I were to cut to the chase here, this is how it's going to look like. So if you were to see uh, the the projection here, so so this this blue line is basically the actual uh, projection uh, of the actual data that I showed you earlier in this uh, earlier in this experiment. If you 
go here this is what it is whereas uh, this this red is basically is, is basically the prediction of the model for the test data that we actually carved out from the input as well and we are seeing if you were to superimpose that on the actual data we we can see if you we see uh, closely that it's not exactly like the same as the input data was it's a little off but it's not way off here right so so i mean if you were to keep on you know refining it maybe you can actually get this closer a little more also but here is the thing if your projection becomes exactly like how it's supposed to be and it becomes exactly perfect then at times that that is also an indication that your model is overfit basically so it it, it may not always i mean it it, it generally speaking it can never be 100 percent accurate it's going to the machine learning uh, recommendations or the, the outcome is always going to be there and there about but it has the closer it is to the actual projection is, is the better part it if it's like exactly the same then 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 it's an indication that something is not right or something was not tuned properly during training process. Anyway, so it gives you a, a flavor of, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, you go about uh, training a machine learning model. Again, it's again, it's a simplified, uh, you know, example because, you know, in, in maybe in real life you have like, again, lots of data available, but it has a lot of features that, that can be put into consideration and it goes through, I mean, you have to go through uh, you know the the time uh, or or basically you have to go through the rigorous exercise of uh, you know conducting the actual training of the whole model and uh, this thing actually takes time but this is basically something which is very important because the moment you have a reliable model out that can actually be a deep breaker in most situations okay going back to the slide deck uh, now that we have seen a couple of experiments one was statistical model the other one was a neural network approach it's time to introduce Azure Auto ML. So Azure Auto ML, as you may have guessed, since it has the name Azure in it, it's a Microsoft uh, Cloud AI service. Okay, that helps expedite the whole process of identifying the most suitable model for a given use case. Okay, so it's an attempt by Microsoft to help operationalize AI even further. I mean, it helps in the automation of time-intensive tasks. It rapidly iterates over many combinations of, of algorithms and hyperparameters against your supplied data set. And it helps in finding, as I said before, the best model on the success metric of your choosing. I'll show you that uh, real quick in a moment or so. And it's accessible via both designer and the SDKs, uh, SDK notebooks. Uh, so, I mean, it, it has a web UI also, and it has also uh, like uh, the designer, uh, I mean, web UI as well as it has the SDK, so you can actually be used inside your Python notebooks also. Okay, so so what is the so what is the deal here? So, so the whole uh, uh, thing is that, you know, you let the auto ML take control, because the whole idea is that you're going to be uploading your data set. Uh, you're going to be uploading your data set to, um, to the cloud service you are going to be configuring your cloud service properly and then the idea is that you know you let azure ml take control so azure ml is going to take your data set based on your configurations is going to run a number of uh, when i say a number i really mean it uh, that was because i'm just going to be showing you that also uh, but uh, uh, the idea is that you know, no, it, it runs multiple models against your data set and then after that it's, it's done with your uh, with 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 a given run it's going to be coming up with the recommendation of the most suitable model for you uh, that hey this is the best model for for your given use case and allow me to explain what i mean by that so i go here hey, sam. sam do you yes. have a second for a question real quick okay go ahead uh, yeah, this kind of was uh, speaking to what you were talking about earlier. In your time series model, would you be able to do comparison of measure of forecast error, like mean absolute deviation, mean squared error? Um, so that yeah. was the question that we received from uh, the audience. And could you talk, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I'm just going, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are actually a number of success matrices available that you can, you know, um, validate the outcome of your model against and see if your model was actually performing. That's one of the statistical approaches or basically more scientific approach of, of seeing exactly how your model was performing. Actually, I'm just going to be giving an example of that using the Azure ML, uh, you know, uh, demo or, 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 or an overview that I'm just going to be 
uh, showing. So I think it's going to be answering this question in, in a little bit of more detail as well. Okay, so uh, auto auto ML. So uh, rather than I just uh, do the whole thing, I'm just going to show you that you know you can you can configure that on the on the web UI, and uh, the, in, I mean I'm just not going to be creating a data set. I'm just going to reuse a data set that was already uh, used in one of the experiments before. We can create a new run here. We can name it like test run. Uh, okay, so we can actually view data set also if, if you want to. By the way, it's the same data set. So you have like the date and the energy drink and things. You also have the, the seasons here. Okay, so target column it's asking for, which is the prediction. We're going to say this is a target column. It also asks us to, you know, specify uh, a cluster because it's the cluster of VMs on which this whole training is going to be performed or basically this run is going to be executed on. I'm just going to uh, click on one of those here. Okay, now in this step is uh, this Azure service is giving me hints as to what is the the, uh, the task type. Is that a classification uh, problem that you're trying to solve it? Is this a regression problem or is it a time series forecasting problem? Are we going to say this is a time series forecasting problem? Said, okay, then tell me about your time dimension here. I'm just going to have to specify that date is that column. Okay, and it can, here we can also like you know specify a group by columns. I mean, if assuming if your data set has a number of other features also that can impact the outcome, you can keep choosing them here, right? And then you can hit finish. I'm not, not going to do that because it takes a while. I mean, even though on, on our data set, it, close, uh, it takes close to 20, 25 minutes or so. But I'm just going to be showing you the outcome of one of the runs that we executed before. So if you were to go to experiments here, but click on that. Okay, so this was a run that was executed earlier. So, so the result is saying that, you know, the algorithm Right, so the algorithm that was most suitable for the given data set and the primary metric of success, which was normalized root mean squared error, and this is the 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 value that was just basically the result of the test run here. So the the more closer it is to zero, the better it is. So, so the lower it is, the better it's performing your model in a way. But you know there are other uh, success matrices also that or primary matrices that we can specify. I'll give you. An example of that also. So those are the ones that are available. We can, by the way, use them in our Python notebooks as well. If if you're doing carrying out an experiment ourselves, so like mean absolute error, that was the question that was being asked, or the normalized mean absolute error. So we 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 can use or we can specify those here in Auto ML also, and we can also use those in 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 our experiments as well that we are going to be carrying out, in which we are not using the capabilities of Auto ML. Okay. So the voting ensemble. Um, was the algorithm name that was that was the best suited out of how many? So if we look at the number of models that were being used in in this specific run, I mean these are the number of models. So AutoML took in our data set and also our configurations and start running that data sets uh, data set and the configurations against those many uh, those many algorithms, right? Now we can also limit the number of uh, algorithms there because it's the it's the function of the of the the uh, the input data size uh, because the, the bigger the data size is the more time is going to take but the idea is we can also limit the number of ex, uh, number of algorithms here also during our configurations that hey we don't want you to run it against each and every algorithm that you find but I just want you to run my uh, data against only a handful of them and, and tell me as to which one was the most suitable okay so we we'll click on that and 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 we see that if if this is the one that we want, and maybe we can deploy that right away. If you were to click on the deploy button here, that model goes and becomes a web service. So it becomes like a an endpoint, and and you can actually start using that in your application, uh, in 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 whichever I mean, I, depending upon your uh, your uh, requirements in a way. I mean, it could be a mobile application, it could be a web application, or you can actually download that as a pickle file also. Yeah, so you download that as a pickle file. You can import that in your uh, Jupyter notebook, and you keep on going with your experimentation that way as well. 
so i mean it it helps expediting the process a lot uh, if you were to if you were to take it to look at it from that perspective um so going back to the presentation slide that i that's pretty much it from uh, uh, from my side uh, if you have any questions please be feel free to ask and with that i'm just going to hand it over to Zach. Thank you, Sam. Uh, that was uh, really, really informative. If you could, could you go to the next slide for me? Absolutely. Well, if you would like to learn more about using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to help forecast sales, we are offering an hour-long one-on-one workshop. Uh, during the workshop, we'll brainstorm with you, uh, discuss your sales forecasting challenges, other aspects of your business that might benefit from utilizing AI. Uh, for example, we recently have built an AI-based invoice automation tool for accounts payable, and we built a sentiment analysis tool to help gauge customer satisfaction. Uh, at the end of this workshop, you'll have an AI adoption strategy that you can utilize for your business. As for the goal of our webinar today, we'd like you to have a better understanding about AI. And that is AI isn't scary at all. It's just another business technology you can use to improve uh, your sales or other aspects of your business. Uh, the bottom line is embrace, not fear AI. Uh, we will be sending a copy of our slide deck, a recording of today's webinar, and a link to our website's AI page. Uh, this is where you can learn more about using uh, AI for your business. Uh, next slide, Sam. In the end, if you do want to get a hold of us, you can use uh, this email address, info at Alpha Bold, or any one of these phone numbers um, to uh, reach us directly. Uh, again, we will be sending out a email uh, with a copy of the webinar and links um, to you uh, where you will be able to uh, get more information about AI and your business and uh, respond to set up that uh, workshop. Uh, and I guess that about wraps up our webinar today. Are there any other questions? Yes, so Jack, there's one question. Sure. Uh, Sam, the question is how you import a data set in Azure. Can you please show that? Oh, I, if I were to go here in Azure, um, you go to Azure Auto ML, you click on this automated run, you create a data set, and from here you can specify the option. I mean, it can be from a web file, it could be from a data store, and could also be a local file. So you click on that and you browse to your data set. I don't have one data set available on, on this system right now, but I mean, if you have like a CSV file or any other form in which you have the data set available, you choose one of those options and then it's going to get uploaded to uh, to the AI service, just like we did with this this one. Awesome. And then there's another question as well. Uh, what's your favorite tool for AI forecasting? Uh, Python, and SAS, R, Azure. So cool. Oh, I mean... If you that, I mean, probably I'll also comment on that question. Uh, okay. Right, so I mean, this is a very interesting question. Uh, I mean, this is like pitting one formula against the other. I mean, you're talking about science here. Uh, it all depends upon exactly the, I mean, see, the, the whole, the, the whole, uh, the, the meat of the whole AI process is basically going and doing an experiment. And that is why this is not known as developing an app. This is actually known as doing an experiment. And I mean, this is very different from doing the actual software development. So in a way, I mean, whichever strategy seems or which, I mean, you, you have to, you have to make your model go through a number of, uh, models uh, and to see the outcome of that and that is exactly what AutoML is trying to automate for us but the whole idea is that you know uh, it, it, it depends upon exactly what your use case is and in some cases if the if the prospects of the customers are not Azure customers then that's fine we can actually help them implement uh, you know AI based solutions using open source technologies as well most of them are like pipe in, are available in the Python ecosystem you know so we have experience of working on TensorFlow uh, to implement neural networks, we also have experience of working on, you know, statistical models using uh, libraries like the one that I showed you for Arima as well as for Skykit Learn that is available again in, in, in Python. And, uh, 
you know this is this whole ai thing is becoming more and more consumable over the period of time because previously it was just in the realm of the data scientists and these guys are not developers but over the years now there is a shift in that trend and it's becoming more and more developer friendly so you do have a javas uh, javascript uh, you know based uh, frameworks available now as well you have uh, tensorflow js you have you know um, you know other things that are available especially in the google platform in which they can uh, they enable you to do, carry out uh, experimentation on the client which actually could mean your browser or your local machine or maybe in some cases your mobile uh, you know your mo mobile uh, devices as well so i mean it, it so so the so the answer to this question is it depends on uh, upon exactly the kind of problem that you end up uh, trying to solve in a way and just to add to that so you might find some of the experiments that are being that are already available in different formats in Python. So you would take in that information, you would probably put it in Azure, and then you would see how that performs versus some of the other models that are available. So it's probably a combination of all of them as well, to some extent, that you yes. would use to be able to come up with the best solution for your problem. Right, I'm glad you brought this point up. Just just a, a couple of quick words on that. I mean, transfer learning is actually becoming really popular. It depends on exactly what use case is. Uh, it's it's really popular, especially for image classification use cases. So rather than you uh, start everything from scratch, uh, you actually you know use some of the models that are already built, like ImageNet, which is trained on millions of images already. So you just you know give it the pictures that you have available, and then you tend to reuse the learning that is already uh, built into that model and try to extend that learning to your your picture. So that is becoming really popular. And lastly. Microsoft uh, is uh, is Microsoft supports all those frameworks, by the way. So I mean, just to add to the point that you know, it's it, it fully supports technologies like TensorFlow. So that's about it, Jed. I don't have any other questions. Well, it's perfect. You know, thank you, everybody. And just for a little context, uh, as far as you know, hey, are am I the right size? to use um, you know, uh, AI or machine learning to improve my sales forecasting. Um, we work from with everybody from Fortune 100 companies all the way down to startups to help them uh, with their AI uh, for sales, using AI uh, for sales forecasting. So uh, we specifically have targeted uh, medical device companies, and we have a couple companies that we've uh, used to help them with forecasting. And like I said, even small startups, uh, we, we work with a medical headlamp developer that's just getting out of the gates, and they're using AI. So we do have uh, you know, a whole gamut of uh, people that we do work with, both pharma, pharmaceuticals, medical device, and uh, even energy companies, just to give you an idea of a couple of the industries that we work with, uh, where we've been able to help them uh, using uh, AI uh, algorithms to improve their business. So on that note, again, we will be sending out a copy of the webinar, um, a link to our web page, uh, our, our website's uh, AI page, and uh, the slide deck from today's presentation. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and uh, until we uh, talk again, have a great day. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe.